Hello and welcome to today's History Hack. Uh, we've got a really good one for you today that I've been intending to get on for ages uh, and just failed to organise myself. So I've got Lockie with me today. Hello, Lockie. Good morning. Are you all ready for some medieval shit? Absolutely, yeah. Um, let's get out of our boring First World War lane and talk about some stuff that happened, I don't know, before the French Revolution, so I've got no idea about it. Banging. Dan Jones is a household name in historian terms. He's a medievalist by trade and the author of some cracking books from Powers and Thrones, which starts off at the end of antiquity, to The Hollow Crown, which just about touches on the advent of those bloody Tudors none of us can get away from. Uh, but he's recently turned his hand to historical fiction with epic results. Uh, so he's here to talk to us about that today. Hey, Dan. Hey, what's going on? Household name just in history terms, is it? Well, I, I wanted to say household name, but it sounded crawly. But then I was also going to point out that we all of that is true right but we can also say that you're not even the most famous dan historian because there's that bloody snow hogging more attention than you what and you're telling me that snow's more famous than danny dyer now danny dyer the historian don't forget danny <laughs> dyer some, some history stuff like yeah. i'm number i'm number three at best and if we put crookshank in the mix <laughs> and Carlin, I'm I'm down. I'm like might not even make top five. Yeah, <laughs> but you're the, you're the edgy one. So <laughs> you'd be the edgy one. The bad. Right, let's move. Let's move on. Let's move yeah. on. <laughs> right. Okay. I've heard rumours of what would obviously be a very, very, very early midlife writer crisis of sorts that's led to you turning your hand to historical fiction uh, and some epic inspiration as well. So, what made you want to do this? And feel free to name drop as much as you like. Well, uh, when I when I have lot for, for years and years, people have asked me if I was going to do historical fiction and I always said, no, 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 I'll bring shame on my family. It'll be a disaster. I might not be any good at it and so on. And it's all cowardice, but also not really having an idea and not really feeling like I was at a place with writing in general where it was the appropriate time to, to do fiction without it looking like just a sort of distraction. And then uh, on the when I was running up towards my 40th birthday, which was 2021. So in the sort of 18 months preceding that, I started to just feel like, man, maybe I need to, I need to actually get on and do this. And I'd written Powers and Thrones, which you mentioned kind of in the introduction, which was a very, very big nonfiction. Mm-hmm. Book. And, um, and I sort of felt like I'd just come to a place in writing nonfiction. And then uh, if you, the name drop you're waiting for, and I'm cruelly keeping you waiting for, uh, <laughs> I, in summer 2019, so around this time I'm talking about, George R. R. Martin came over to London. George R. R. Martin, writer of you know, Song of Ice and Fire, Cycle, creator of Therefore Game of Thrones. He came over, he'd just written, um, what's it called? Uh, Fire and Blood. The, the, the Targaryen, the, Targaryen prehistory, which has now been made into the the sort of prequel HBO show. He'd just written that and he was promoting it. He was on his way to Comic Con. And Harper Collins, his UK publisher, very kindly asked me to interview him on stage, sort of thousand people in Emmanuel Hall in London. And then we had dinner afterwards. And so I spent, you know, a, a good few hours with George, uh, talking both sort of formally in an interview format and then informally in sort of green room and then over dinner afterwards. And it, the general impression I came away with was like, this guy knows so much about history and he's been working in history or reading history for like more than 50 years. Mm-hmm. And yet he's turning that into something that has sort of like core historical values and propositions but it is something more fun more commercial in in lots of ways um is something else and he but he's managing to retain this kind of serious love for an interest in history whilst also working in a fictional genre and i was like man he and he's also really having loads of fun doing it and i thought come on you know you can't duck this forever so the, those combination of those things after the, pretty much straight away after meeting George I went home and wrote the first three chapters of Essex Dogs which aren't the first three chapters that are in the book one mm-hmm. of them has moved into the sequel but that was the, what made me take the plunge so I guess this is a, this is a, a little bit of a departure from your your previous work isn't it in the sense well, okay we're moving away from non-fiction let's get creative but we're still in your wheelhouse uh, as regards period uh, aren't we so let's let's talk about when uh, for a moment, why this period? Was it the only choice as, as far as you're concerned, or were there other time periods that you looked at and thought about? What's the, what's the background to this? Well, when somebody, when uh, I sort of 
let on that I was kind of finally interested in doing fiction and publishers started asking, what would you actually like to write about? I just had one story in mind. I didn't have, what I've got in nonfiction is usually like three or four options I'm trying to weigh up all the time. I only had one story that I was interested in. I was very, very fixed on what that story was already. I'd been on the beaches of Normandy, um, you know, Omaha Beach, as it was called in D-Day, 1944. Uh, about six months previously, and I just started to play with this idea of D-Day, but it's the Middle Ages, and an, ob- an obvious historical setting for that was the Cressy campaign of 1346, when on the 12th of July, 1346, you had 15,000 English troops uh, disembarked, not on Omaha Beach, a little way up from Utah Beach, uh, St. Valoug. Um, and I just was really interested in this, what if it's got the sensibility and the the sort of narrative flow and the just the, the the imperative and the energy of Saving Private Ryan or Band of Brothers, but it's the 14th century. Yeah, you did so, Caravan, didn't you? So, I mean, that's a, that's an episode name in Band of Brothers. So was that? Yeah, yeah, it? yeah, like, absolutely. And so, I, and I also thought that the Crescent campaign just had very, very obvious, uh, like, um, sort of parallels, resonances, echoes with uh, Normandy 44, that if written in a, you know, if you kept strictly to the 14th century in period terms, but you had the sort of storytelling kind of frequency and energy of a World War II novel, I felt like that was something I hadn't read or seen in, in medieval fiction, which you could parody or caricature as very like, hey, nonny, no, my liege, under ye greenwood tree, I warrant not the French will come here. And um, and so I was, I, I was interested in that tonally. So that was the, the story. Now, it was there's also a sort of pragmatic uh element to it which is uh you know as you said i've done almost all my work before now in the middle ages and that's what my readers i suppose expect me to write and that's also what i feel like i know instinctively best and can navigate that world without having to look absolutely everything up mm-hmm. and so it made sense to to given that the move from non-fiction to fiction is an enormous leap in terms of writerly craft and and style and technique and even the rhythm of the writing day, it made sense to to keep s- some things constant while changing others. Otherwise, it was just going to be a big a big mess all round. And also very co- commercially very hard to position. You know, so your favourite medieval historian called Dan, the medieval historian household name called Dan, uh, is <laughs> is most going to fiction. Historian Dan. <laughs> but guess guess what? He's doing Napoleon or whatever. Just people being like. Nah, it would yeah. be starting from scratch, really. I guess, yeah, I suppose for a first one, it w- was going to have to be the wheelhouse, wasn't it? Like nothing to stop you later on doing whatever you want. But Yeah, that's true. And I think that you've got to move in degrees and increments. But I th- I've also stuck to that sort of as a rule with nonfiction as well. You know, the books do proceed one from the other in certain ways or they come in blocks. So I did the Plantagenets and Summer of Blood and Magna Carta and the Hollow Crown, and they all sort of fit together. And then I did Crusaders, Templars, which were a sort of little duology, and then Powers of Thrones wrapped it all up as as one. So um, there is a, a sort of lot. I think, I think as a writer, I believe you sh- you should be working in some sort of sequence or order. You know that one book clicks through to the next, and they sort of make sense to readers. If you jump about too much, you're asking a lot of readers to follow you and where you're going in your own sort of um, journey, for want of a less cliche word. Mm. Um, one of the strongest things about this book for me was the characterization. So, let, I mean, most of this interview is going to be digging into that because it was brilliant. The book is called Essex Dogs. Why Essex? They're not all technically from Essex, though, are they? What's the reasoning behind all the different regional selections with your heroes? I love the two mute Welshmen. I think they might be my favourite because it's, and I love that the main character's attitude is I just let them do what they want. It'll turn out all right because it generally does. Yeah. So, that, well, God, there's, there's a lot going on there. Okay. So, yeah. let's start, start with Essex Dogs. Mm. The very first sort of sketches I ever did for any of these characters, when they weren't actually in the setting that that they're in, in in the book, I'd done on an aeroplane flying from Prague to London in about 2017. I was was working in Prague for about a year and commuting once every three weeks back and forth between London and Prague. And uh, I just had this uh, bunch of characters on a beach, didn't know what they were for, just knew they were in the Hundred Years' War, made some character notes, and I was just listening to music, and the song Essex Dogs by Blur was on. It's the last song on Blur, Blur, the 2000, 
one I think album and um there's a line in Essex Dogs which is a song about sort of tough weekends in Colchester really I suppose uh which says in these towns the English army grinds its teeth and I like that line just like that line and it had a mood about it that said like football hooligans that said or just not even that just said like just tough yeah tough towns and I like the idea that these guys who were going over to fight in the Hundred Years War were analogous with um tough towns from from the sort of southeast of England and so uh, I but I called the file Essex Dogs just because that's what I was listening to and it, it never changed and when I came to write the novel I just thought well that's a good enough title for them to have maybe I'll change it as I as I as it develops and and mm-hmm. they really really owned the name and what I quite liked and so then the next part of your question was um, they're not all from Essex, are they? And I like I like that because I like the idea that in fiction, in fiction, you're always setting up rules in order to break them. And the idea that these guys, are the Essex dogs, and yet half of them aren't even from Essex. I just like that as a sort of that's how life actually works, right? Yeah. And uh, then you have yeah, then you have just this this range of different characters who sort of developed as I wrote. I didn't see a lot of who they were coming from the off there was a much less free planning in this book than I would do in a, a work of non-fiction um and the Welshman Darris and Linton are um well if you, you know if part of the premise not the whole premise of Essex Dogs is you've got an American war book in medieval clothes that's that's like one way of reading it. it's not the only way of reading it um this is a kind of wild west you know frontier wars that that aspect of the book these are the native americans these are the indians these are like tonto and so they they don't really adhere to any of the rules at all they're just doing their own thing and they happen to be there and love day the you know the reluctant captain of the essex dogs as as you say it's like i'd love to tell them what to do but (laughs) <laughs> the whole thing is like like that's it's just illusory but that speaks to a much deeper theme of of the, the book in general which is about agency power um autonomy uh and the essence dogs have vanishingly little agency yeah um most historical fiction books or a lot of historical fiction books particularly in this period always seem to feature a um uh a sort of classic Bernard Cornwell character. And I love Bernard and I think he's, he's totally, totally amazing. His characters always have massive amounts of agency. You know, they, they barrel towards history. They grab it, they twist it, they take it, they make it their own. And that's that's great. But I, I was interested in writing a book where the opposite was happening, where you have the, these these guys who are like quite hard, quite tough, quite long in the tooth. They've done a lot. They've seen a lot. They're capable of doing a lot in some cases. And yet they're plunged into this situation in this 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 march this, uh, towards a, a battle, where every time they think they're doing something, they like pull the lever and the lever just comes off in their hand. They realise they don't really have any agency at all, and, and they're told what to do. And it doesn't even if it doesn't make sense, they just have to do it. And even when you think they're about to change history by some action, like the, the ground gives way under their feet, and and I. The people I spoke to both before writing the book and afterwards who had military experience, particularly at the sort of level that the Essex dogs are at, if there's an analogous level in, in, in modern military or like that does bear some resemblance to reality. Like you're just told to do stuff because you're told to do it and you have to do it. And if it makes sense, great, but it might not, it might get you nowhere and it might just seem totally pointless and it might be totally pointless. And I wanted to create that as a, as a mood as well but I really do like as well that you say that they have no agency and and that does come across but they also as well they're not wussy and submissive no like there's that brilliant I just I'm remembering so it's about 20 percent of the way in because I'm reading on this on a kindle where um that fat lord comes along and starts waffling at them and in his reaction he's not contrite he's not respectful he's not disrespectful but he literally just carries on sitting there I think he's carving his little model, isn't he? Just like, yeah, whatever, waffle away, dude. I'm not, not really interested in what you're saying to me. Yeah. Yes, and and I like, I just, I was trying to create in this book, the, a, a, I was trying to give it 
the reality on the ground of what organizations are like, particularly in the Middle Ages, where the, the, the whole idea of an organization is very, very underdeveloped in, in the way that we would understand an organization, and that people are operating according to overlapping different systems of organization and of behavior. And the the, the obvious one that's going on um, in Essex Dogs is you have the sort of lordly types are uh, operating and optimizing for what they would call chivalry or we would call chivalry certainly and they would probably call chivalry and some of them are good at it and some of them are bad at it and the ones who are good at it and the ones who are bad at it don't necessarily overlap with who the quote unquote good people and bad people are yeah, there's and one of got... them, isn't he he um he's waffling about it's not like the good old days the chivalry's gone and all that he he's not happy yeah and, and everyone's got a different take on it and some of them are like this is the golden age chivalry some are like nah chivalry's dead man and then you've got the ordinary guys on the ground who have different levels of experience and different sort of commitment to any values they hold you know love days you know, the main deepest held value is leave no man behind sort of thing but even within his group, you've got others who are like, yeah, I'll take that or leave it. And so you, you all of these people in all of these different roles with these these colliding um, worldviews, philosophies, uh, that, that they're all coming in from different directions. And then it's all totally skewed by just this sort of randomness of personality and then, and then the randomness of events. And so even though what Essex Dogs is as a whole is a caper and it is a campaign and it's an adventure story leading up to the the, the climax of the big battle, what I wanted to get into it was like this. And this is the thing that George R. R. Martin does better than anyone else I've ever read is say, OK, so here's the theory of this this world, this, in his case, quasi historical world I've set up. Now let's just throw a bunch of people with their own random personalities into it and see what happens. Because that's like, that's history. That's what history is. And the biggest argument we ever have when we talk about nonfiction history is, is it great men or is it great factors and powers? And the reality is so obviously like it's the, it's the intersection of those two things, you know, just like the randomness of personality thrown at the particularity of time and the, and the, um, and the, the, the greater sort of, movements and flows of big capital H history it was, it was exciting and interesting to me to explore those serious historical debates through the lens of a novel that also had the word fuck in it an awful lot yeah, do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, as soon as the first swear started coming it was like <laughs> you're like oh no yes. he's they've re- not he's no I was like really they've is. not aged you it's brilliant sweary Dan is there <laughs> these people are about to meet me in person oh, for the first, first time first sea bomb boom <laughs> <laughs> We could rabbit hole, couldn't we, completely talking about evolution, not only societally as well, but this is like how standing armies come about. And Lockie's a tactician, like, so, but let's not do it. Let's not get into the whole Hundred Years' War and, like, birth of modern warfare, maybe, and stuff like that. Lockie, takes away quick. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm already sort of thinking about saving Bowman Ryan. And anyway, <laughs> I, I, part of the reason I'm on this, at least, is because I'm from East Anglia. Uh, and I think Alex has uh, been laughing at the arsehole element of your book, uh, being from East Anglia and uh, the, the idea that one of my ancestors might be... Um, some of the worst personality uh, traits that you, you find in the book. Um, any uh, any particular reason that my people have come in for? Because such... they were na- they were neighbours. So it's like you know you've got some of these boys from Essex, and it's like who who do you tend to? Who are your main rivals? It's your neighbour. You know, I wrote I, I did I did a lot of sports journalism when I was in my twenties. I wrote a sports newspaper column for ten years, and I was already I'm already like a, a big sports fan, and so. Uh, the uh, and one of the models in my mind for the English army on a chevauchet put aside the the theory of the tactics was this is this really resembled in my mind England going away to play football you know and particularly if we, if you think back to like the start of the 21st century the end of the 20th century Charleroi Marseille all of those places where the English went out and smashed up before they pro- really started taking people's passports away there was something of that energy I was trying to put in. And I, and then, and so in my mind, I had little football crews, you know, each, this army's made up of like, if you, if you've ever been seen England, been to an England away match. Yeah. Have you been, yeah. England, right. England I've away, been you know, to Chelsea like, away in Paris. Does that 
<laughs> no, well, so so actually, it's different. England away is different because yeah. England away, you don't often get Chelsea, Man United, Man City, the big clubs. No, you yeah. get like Yeovil and Torquay and Kidderminster and Scunthorpe <laughs> yeah. because uh, you, they're not going away in Europe, right? So uh, and and each of these little groups will have their sort of shop front that they're in. And I thought this is a good like mental mental analogy for me to have as I'm trying to picture the sort of the, the dregs, if you like, of the English army at this point. You know, they're set up in rival doors. And who do you hate the most? You hate your neighbour the most, typically. And so the East Anglians, I was like, well, they're, they're, the Essex dogs, who are they going to hate the most? Probably the people from Suffolk, I imagine. What's, what's brilliant, though, is now Lockie is completely in love with this book because now he's just seeing, because he's Ipswich Town. He's like, so basically the band oh, is okay. Ipswich Town crew on tour. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, and actually... Which, I'm, which happens just, very, very rarely, as you say, yeah. <laughs> so I've just finished... Wolves of Winter, which is the sequel, and uh, one of the, the the big protagonists who appears only by name in Essex Dogs, you just hear that he's over there, over somewhere, is uh, Sir Hugh Hastings, and he's an East Anglian as well. And so things have all sort of fitted together quite well in um, uh, in in the sequel to Essex Dogs, and the, some of these plot lines do carry on. Some of the characters come back as well. So one thing I really like about <clears throat> you mentioned a, a lord there. It is from the point of view of the everyman, which is great. Um, it would have been really easy, and this is something, and again, not a criticism, but Bernard Cornwell's very good at making like aristocratic wankers out of characters. Like, I'm thinking Simerson here, and we've had Michael Cochran's been on this podcast loads, and he's brilliant, and I love him, but he was awesome at being just a tough wanker. Uh, you yeah. haven't gone all the way down that road. You've kept a balance to it. Was that intentional? Uh, I've tried to put just throw a mix in, and so you've got on you've got some. I think you've got some wank. I mean, you've got Sir Robert, who's an absolute dick. You've got uh, the Prince of Wales, who's a really, really messed up sixteen-year-old, nominally given chance of uh, charge of of the army, uh, trying to be a big man and 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 really having horrible effects on people in ways that he doesn't quite intend. Um, but is too proud to acknowledge. You've got uh, the Earl of Warwick, who is a sort of off-the-shelf kind of shiny haired, gleaming teeth, nice armour. Um, sort of bit of a. He's not a dick, and he's not not a dick. He's just he's just that. He's living for this kind of world and role. <clears throat> and then you've got the Earl of Northampton, who's my favourite of the lords, who presents initially as a total dick as like the coarsest, most horrible, most like abrasive of all of them. But I I felt at the end of the book, and and the more times I read it through during the edit, and then when I just was you know, read it for the couple of, the last time before we, we sent it off to press, came out as like the most heroic of all, the, or the most um, human of all these lords. And the one who actually understood and sometimes cared about the ordinary men, but but and I think Bert, as you say, Bernard makes is so fantastic at doing uh, bastard, awful wanker nobles. And I, my favourite, maybe I mean the best of all of them is um, is Alfred. Like when we first meet him in Utrecht, he's just like such a drippy. <laughs> but he's a prig as well as being a drip and 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 i i thought that's masterful but I, I you know again you know i look at, at george r r martin and say or and see um this this real complexity to his baddies none of or very very few of whom are, are just sort of universally a wanker they're all capable of goodness badness laziness idleness they're real sort of fleshed out people and that model for me was something that um was quite important as I was thinking about it and also you know I've, I sort of know um uh Paul Abbott a little bit who created Shameless and I've spoken to Paul quite a few times over the years he's married to a friend of mine and Paul is a is for me the you know up there as greatest screenwriter of, alive certainly of his own generation and he's got some solid rules for creating characters on screen who are apparently not that likable and he's always like give your best best lines to the bad guys mm. 
and he really believes you know he he's always had that sort of that mischievous sense of of giving real charisma to your bad guys so that it's it's it creates a more complicated reaction in the reader or in this case the viewer it's so like well I, I i don't just just solidly hate this person they're also coming out with some absolute zingers and so they, they, that i think gives us um gives a sort of depth it just gives a depth to the story and a very similitude that then allows you to do other things within fiction that are less plausible you can get away with particularly plot points yeah uh, you can get away with less plausible pop, plot points i believe if you you've got more kind of believable grounded uh, d- d- deeper characters keeping it keeping it real the first thing the king does is all fall flat on his face getting off, out of the boat on the beach is that real did that happen yeah that's that's real and so the other the other thing that i was doing in or one of the other things i'm doing in the book is <clears throat> taking historical vignettes of which there are quite a few from particularly from the Cressy campaign that have been passed into the world of historical sort of canon and law by the chroniclers of the time especially Jean Froissart um so the king falls on his flat on his face he gets off the ship and Froissart writes this up and then he leaps to his feet and goes you see the, the, the this and he's got bloody nose this just proves the land wants me it's so keen to have me that it drags me down to it and and, and has my blood now <clears throat> if if we say okay that pro- let's let's just agree that that happened that we believe it then self-evidently Froissart's uh sort of toady sucky uppy um, depiction of it paints Edward in the best possible light for having done something totally um, hopeless. <clears throat> and what I wanted to do was show you those same events through the eyes of people who were had no interest in in the in chivalry, in uh, uh, the sort of the heroism of and the code of knightliness. I want I, I want them. They look at Edwards and they don't even see it. What it would be, the easiest thing in the world to do with that scene is to have someone actually standing on the spot as the king falls over, and then you play a lot of dialogue around it. But I find it much sort of more mischievous, more fun to. They just refer to the dogs are sitting on the beach, and they're not more interested in what they're eating than the king falling flat on his face and this thing that Froissart will eventually say is so important. They're like, oh, yeah, uh, did you see that wanker fall over and get a bloody nose? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then one of them's go, yeah, well, if he hears you saying that, you'll be strung up, mate, because you're a stinking Scot. And it's like, that's what it's like being a, a human being, I think, full stop. But also that's what the 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 common experience of almost everybody on that beach would have been, not standing right next to the king. And and hearing the dialogue played out, but seeing it over there and, and passing it <clears throat> into your own scheme of understanding of what's going on, um, rather than us taking the sort of the, the chronicler's version. If you're writing the nonfiction book, you inevitably will use that Froissart anecdote and, and build around it in your storytelling. And part of the point of fiction for me is, okay, let's put the camera in a totally different place and see how this thing looks when we're we're actually watching something else. Well, staying with your own scheme of understanding then, um, you you get the opportunity with fiction to project a little bit. And your main man, uh, Lovedacre Talbot, we mentioned him. How did he come about and how much of you is in there? (laughs) Everyone seems to think that I, I, I love day is a sort of little uh, marionette for me. I don't know why he's sort of forty years old and slightly over the hill. And <laughs> no, um, love day is so the character of love day evolved sort of from his name. You mentioned Alex in your introduction, the Hollow Crown, yeah. which is a book when I about the Wars of the Roses, Rise of the Tudors. I wrote it's my third non-fiction book. And fleeting mention, really, uh, there was a thing called a love day, uh, which I think was 1454 or six. Can't remember so long ago since I read that book. Um, but the love day was essentially the houses of the quote unquote houses of York and Lancaster, which were overlapping and not totally clearly defined. Um, rival camps within a very complicated English political situation at that time. 
in a in a very misconstrued bid to get them all to be friends again a love day was organized in which they all paraded ceremonially through the streets i believe of london um paired off as rivals hand in hand so red and white red and white red and white red and white as as we would depict it if we were doing the drama now but that's literally how the pageant looked these supposed teams of enemies and what it did in that context was disastrous because it lined up these sort of complicated overlapping factions into two very clear enemy camps. Anyway, that's what the love day was that I was thinking of. And so what I wanted to bring out of that scene into a character in a totally different context was a sense of being, uh, of having two competing things going on at once and trying to hold them together when they're inevitably pulling apart. And love day, uh, is coming towards the end of his career, let's say. He's in charge of the Essex Dogs, but he doesn't really want to be. But he feels the responsibility that he should be, but he really hates doing it. So there's your first sort of internal conflict already set up. They've lost their leader, the captain. Loveday's had to step up. He's not even sure if he's the right person to do it. But he is committed. Now he is doing it to doing it the right way. Except that every time he tries to do it the right way, something goes wrong and it get, things get much worse. Um, he's, he's clearly not as fit as he used to be. He's been, he's had sort of one bath or too many. He's, love, lived he's, a, he's got rid of his chain mail because it doesn't fit over his belly anymore. It's, yeah, it's too, it's like, it's old and fit. He just may as well just like take the risk. You know, it's so sounding a lot these, like my rugby career, by the way. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, I suppose you, you and your listeners will be, will be detecting just how many sporting analogies are sort of buried within my psyche in general <laughs> and this novel in specific. But, um, yeah, he's, it's just, he's just crested the hill and he's, he's a little bit late realizing it. But I like as uh, well, he just, there's an element of him that's just tired. Like, he's tired. He's, he's exhausted. He's worn he out. Yeah, it's a 40 day contract. Off we go, make some money. This is what I do. But at what point am I just too old for this shit? Absolutely. And Again, you know, it's, in his uh, rugby career. It's, like... it's rugby, it's boxing, it's the, you know, the we've seen so many boxing movies about the fighters had one fight too many, you know, yeah. and they, they realized in the middle of that fight that they're gun shy and they're scared. And that's sort of where Love Day's psychology is. I was very tired when I was writing this book because I had a, we had a newborn baby in the house, so it was it was good to be able to channel tired energy into this this one character. But being just fundamentally being knackered is is a sort of really really profound kind of emotional state that a lot of us find ourselves in. But we don't really we would certainly in nonfiction never consider being knackered as a sort of a moving force in history. Just like being drunk is massively underplayed as a as a moving force in in history <laughs> or be or people being dumb is like we don't we don't really characterize we don't say my approach to history is that stupidity drunkenness tiredness <laughs> are the three mo- great moving factors of history because that would seem in for a dig and and to sort of traduce our, our noble subject but in fiction you're allowed to, to play with these ideas a bit more so love is just really Tired, and I don't mean he hasn't had enough sleep. I mean he's just like been around the block one time too many. He's weary, but he feels like so. He's he's been determined to keep going. That's that's just been how he's always worked, and yet he's finding his legs don't work as fast as they used to. And and so, I suppose to return to your implication from earlier that this is my midlife crisis (laughs) project. Yeah, very, like, I said very, very early midlife crisis because very, obviously very I'm not nearly old enough. Well, who knows how far we are along in the story? Yeah. Um, but let's hope. Uh, you know, this is some. These are ideas that I suppose I would say I've started to understand better now that I'm on this side of my fortieth birthday. That had I tried to sit down at the age of when I'd written one or two books when I was at like 29 or 31 or whatever, I definitely wouldn't have been able to access like on a psychological, emotional level and let alone channel into a work of fiction that was doing lots of other things at the same time. I think you've already mentioned drunkenness. I think my favourite character in the whole book is the priest, father. father. As anyone else would have had, right? Um, 
and and it, like again, not a criticism, but Bernard Cormer would have had the priest as like a spiritual anchor, wandering along with this yeah. group of misfits, um, and he would have been the grown up and the adult, but not you, Dan. No, he's a drunken liability, uh, yeah. and literally instead of every, he, instead of turning up and you thinking. Oh, here's someone who'll re- like rectify the situation. Every time he shows up, you're like, oh my God, what is he going to do now? And the more sober he is, the more of a liability he is. Where did he come from and why did you go down that road with him? Um, he's another person who's at the, the wrong end of his career. And he has originally, you know, in, <clears throat> in the American War book, he's the medic, right? Um, but... You know, I can't. I can't say I planned any of these characters. They, I would. I would definitely say they, re- they revealed themselves to me. And once I had a priest, and I had pictures of them all on my wall, and just looked at their faces a lot. And I, I got a lot of the pictures out. I've got, I've got some of those Tashin big format um, Renaissance art books, and I've got a. The, my particular favourite is uh, Van Eyck, Jan Van Eyck in detail. And you go to the back. If you go to the background of lots of Van Eyck pictures you'll find some incredible faces. And I can't remember if father was a Van Eyck figure, but he, he, he could well have been, or he, he might've been you know, Rocky van der Weyden or someone like that. Uh, and he just had a kind of face and I thought that guy looks horrible. And, you know, one of the other things I've done as well as contemplating sport a lot in my life is drinking a lot of quite rough pubs. <laughs> and my, one of my favorite things to do is drink in a, like a, a sort of on the edge of being actually dangerous pub on my own and befriend the local people. And I've just done that so much over the course of my life. I've met you some really, really like unique, like career alcoholics yeah. in rough pubs. And often they're the landlord. It's a great and, way to do this in America as well. When you go to an American yeah. pub, sit at the bar and talk to the person next to you. It's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. There's a landlord, well, he's not a landlord, he just works there, or did last time I was over there, which actually a little while ago now, in my favourite pub in New York City, which is called the Ear Inn, Spring Street in Washington. And it's called the Ear, because originally the two curves fell out of the word bar <laughs> on the sign. And it's not that rough anymore, but they've got a real Rick, who works behind the bar, they're like a real tosser. Or I suppose the, the 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 famous version of this person in London pub, um, London pubs was Norman Balin, who ran um, Coach and Horses in its in its uh, Soho heyday. Um, when I was a young undergraduate, we he was still alive, and we used to come down to London and drink there. And he chucked my mate Ben Wilson, actually the eminent historian Ben Wilson. Oh yeah, um, he's been on. Yeah, he chucked Ben out for drinking too slowly once. <laughs> ben, ben and I, Ben and I spent a lot of time in pubs. We were at the same college, exact contemporaries, doing history. And Ben and I are still our firm friends. And uh, Wilson was, yeah, he was chucked out of the coach and horses for drinking too slowly by Norman Balin. So, so fathers are sort. So there's, you know. We draw inspiration from all these sort of places. Father, in the in the speed of the novel, is a, a disgraced priest who's forgotten almost anything about what it actually means to be a priest, except for um, when it gives him a chance to sort of lord it over someone else. But even that's become increasingly inc- unconvincing. Um, and he's just he's not a good guy. He's not a good guy. And, and worse than that, he actively likes being a, a bad person. And he's he was one of my favourite characters, right? He, Northampton, Scotsman were probably my uh, and Romford for different reasons, but but they get they get some good lines. And Father, uh, yeah, particularly when they in the middle of the book, I think I know what you're, without re- spoiling it for anyone. In the middle of the book, when they sober Father up and try and save his life, <laughs> and all he's got to do is one job, <laughs> and that's <laughs> pretend to be that's pretend to be. A not a priest, a friar. Priest. <laughs> Pretend to be a man of the church. Well, you are a man. You should like you. This should be the easiest thing in the world. And he just he's just complaining about it the whole way. And he's actually not very good at it. <laughs> and it doesn't. Things don't work out so well after that. So um, <laughs> that's just there's a moment me, a funny there where like. Love Day is going. He's like deploying everybody around a village to make sure it's empty yeah. and stuff. Um, and he's like putting people into pairs. And then he sort of looks yeah. to his right and realizes the person oh. that's responsible for his life. He's ended up with father, and he just like thinks, "Oh shit." Yeah, but that's a very Love Day thing to do, which is to say, okay, I'm going to pair everyone off and I'm going to take one for the team and I'm going to pair myself with Father and then to realise too late that 
this wasn't even the best thing to do. You know, there's other people on the team who could definitely have handled being paired up with Father better than Loveday does, yeah. but he does it out of this this um, this overweening instinct to protect people he, who actually don't need protecting. He, you know, he's gradually as over, particularly in the second book, which I said I've just finished. Loveday's journey towards realizing that all the protecting he's trying to do is uh, is pride and f- failure to admit that he himself needs a bit of protection. That's that's the sort of journey he's going on. Well, I mean, all these stepping back into the sort of literary world and and uh, comparisons. I mean, this is necessarily because of the period and the and the style. I'm going to draw comparisons with Bernard Cornwell. Um, is this, was this a kind of conscious decision or conscious sort of thought you had as you were writing that you, you're going to draw comparisons with Bernard or, or go toe to toe with him? No, not at all. I, I know Bernard a little bit and um, I admire him massively. And every time we've ever spoken, I've come away thinking, wow, I've just had some like incredible insight into the, the business of writing. <laughs> Uh, and I'm I'm a huge admirer of his books. I I didn't I wasn't really thinking in those terms as I was writing. My two, the two novelists I'd probably read the most around the time I started writing was reading the most in terms of popular um, mainstream mass market fiction were James Elroy. My favourite historical novel of all time is American Tabloid by James Elroy, uh, the, the lead up to the Kennedy assassination. And Elroy's insight, which I leaned heavily into, was to see these big historical characters from the eyes of people one level below. So if you're, have you read American Tabloid? I'm 17% of the way in. <laughs> I it's, like it. It's, it's sensational. Yeah. And Kemper Boyd, Ward Littell and Pete Bondurant are, are like bag men, as you, as you know, like hit men, fixers for the likes of Jimmy Hoffa, Bobby Kennedy, Jack Kennedy, Carlos Maidana, you know, all of the all of the players in, in that, that world. I was really interested in that model. Okay, you're gonna see the big historical event, but from below, rather than the eyes of the protagonists. And the other writer I was just reading a lot was Lee Child. I was just reading so many Reacher novels, I was just banging out Reacher novel after Reacher novel. And in fact, I had to I had to really put the brakes on my consumption of Lee Child novels and put something like uh, a higher brow, maybe that's the wrong word, in between each one, because I was getting too hyped up by Reacher's exploits. So, I, <laughs> so for a while I did Reacher novel, and I, was, I read Knausgaard, um, you know, that, that epic six-volume, my struggle thing about just being bored in Norway. Each book like uh, 700 pages long. So I went, Reacher, Knausgaard, Reacher, Knausgaard, Reacher, Knausgaard. <laughs> it was a really weird thing to sort of... <laughs> it's a distinct lack of gunfights in one of them, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. But Reacher, so I, I like the uh, the energy of Reacher, and I think Lee Child is almost peerless as a writer of uh, of action. I liked the the perspective and the the grotesque analysis of history of Elroy. Bernard, I just was like, I suppose, dimly aware somewhere that the master of historical adventure, who'd spent a lot of time in the Middle Ages, was Bernard. But as I say, I, you know, I was also very aware that I, I was interested in writing a difference. I was just interested in presenting a different view, not just of the Middle Ages, but of, um, of human power dynamics than Bernard. I think Bernard uh, uh, yeah. has, has established as the style here by virtue of his own greatness. I um, think the only, the biggest agency. parallel, yeah, the biggest parallel with, for me with this and Bernard Cornwell is, is just the pacing. I think the pacing, there are parallels between them, but not necessarily the style. Yeah. And, and pace is, pace was something that was quite, but I, you know, I'd, I'd, I was quite comfortable with writing to pace. I've always written, um, pretty high paced novels the biggest complaint no well, i've had a lot of complaints mercifully about this book is actually it, it starts too slowly people have said oh yeah i found it hard to get into which i found amazing given you've got a massive fight on on a beach yeah. <laughs> for about <10 laughs> yeah. days. there's loads of dead so, frenchmen but, right but, at the beginning like what more yeah do- so but, but what you actually get thereafter and i felt that i had to do this in order to set up the mood correctly was you have about three quite short chapters where they're bored and they're marching along and they keep expecting a fight and they don't get one because that was the nature of that part of the campaign. And the other thing I wanted to set up was 
well, you're going to see a slightly different vision of medieval warfare here, where instead of everybody having a, a an archery battle every five seconds, there are loads of days, even weeks, where nothing happens except, you know, you eat crap food, you shit in a hole, and you get bitten by mosquitoes. Yeah. And that... So there are three chapters early on where it, um, it creeps along and then it accelerates again. Um... And so that, but that, I don't think, think even that is particularly slow. And as I say, I'm speaking, but that, but then as I say, I'm speaking as somebody who has read all six volumes of Canal Scarred, where yeah. <laughs> there are, have, have you read any Canal Scarred? No, it's too glacial for me. Like right, I'm, right. I'm, I'm, I'm right. making shopping lists after a couple of pages. I'm like, I'm done. So in, which is it? I think it must be uh, A Death in the Family, book one of Canal Scarred. It's legitimately 150 pages where they hide their teenagers they hide the beer in a bush it's new year's eve they're going out they walk ages then they have to go back and get the beer and then they get picked up by the uncle and then they go back and then they finally get to the party and the party's basically over and like that's for me that's slow that's slow stuff <laughs> I'm, I I'm here for are, it but I'm, that's not people, the pace i write yeah i mean are they are people is it a lazy analogy with Cornwell purely based on the fact that you've got a band of intrepid nobodies like he did with Sharp. I think maybe that's why people, it's their yeah, first it way. Be. But then, I mean, it's never going to hurt to have it associated with Bernard, is it? Look, I just think it's because he's the, he's the, he's the governor, isn't it? Like, he's the guy's like, owns the division and it's because he's the best at it. And there are other people writing medieval sort of <laughs> adventure stuff, right? But everybody's going to be compared to Bernard because he's like, he's the, he's the master. So um, it's natural. It's normal to be compared favorably is an incredible compliment. Um, we can all learn something from reading Bernard Cornwell. And I think the guy's just, he's done, he's done so much, right? He's one of these writers who's done so much that, that you forget, what life must have been like before there was Bernard Cornwell. You know, to, to make this world of medieval adventure fiction just seem like a natural part of the historical fiction landscape and something that any reader vaguely interested in historical fiction would be happy to walk in a bookshop, pick up Bernard Cornwell and go, yeah, 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 I, I think I know what's going to be. This world does not ter ter terrify me. He's, he, you know, he's like, he's created a genre. And well, not created a genre, but he's 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 made it sort of um, easy and approachable and accessible for people, and that's that's like huge. That's huge. That's huge. We're just so like lucky as as writers of this sort of stuff to have um, to have him around. Just finally, before we finally stop waffling on at you, um, the ev evocation of France is brilliant. Uh, I've done I've done two sad little historical novels myself I just, how anal were you with the research did you do that thing where you're a historian and you find yourself agonizing over some twattish detail and then you realize you don't have to play by the rules because it's fiction and you can do whatever you want because I found that liberation quite terrifying at times um I mostly just made it up and then went back I did a sort of egregiousness pass um and there's a whole you know there's the whole Romford is a is a as a sort of junky fiend storyline, which I made sure was was just plausible within the the drug technology of the time. I love him sneaking and, around an apothecary, like sniffing the jars. And yeah, the guys, the guys, naughty. Look, <laughs> at the you know, I knew some of the landscape and have been to all of the places that are described. Um, Particularly with the battle at the end, I was very, 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 very fortunate that the great um, Michael Livingston, who is publishing his groundbreaking new history of the Battle of Cressy and the Cressy campaign, at the at the same time I was publishing Essex Dogs, let me read his book, which actually relocates the Cressy battle site and completely redraws how we think the battle operated. He let me read that before it was published. And so I made sure that the Battle of you know, the Battle of Cressy was on point in terms of its movements. But we're, we still see the Battle of Cressy from the perspective of one character who's stuck on the floor for most of it. So um, so we're, well, we're doing quite different things, Mike and I. But 
there, there were moments when it's like, okay, it's important to be on point here. And mostly I wrote fast, then went back and made sure it was, you know, that it, it, it stacked up because um, I felt like it was more, you know, it's, it, you've got to be swept along by the scene. There are readers uh, of historical fiction and there are whole, whole subgenres of historical fiction in which the accuracy is the point. I get that. And the, you know, I think it's a lot of naval historical yeah. fiction, isn't it? It's just about having the right sheet yeah. and knowing right. that it's called a sheet, right. not Twigs a rope. and ropes and, yeah, it's... That's, uh... a, that's, that's a thing. That's a thing. Well, I think it's Patrick not... O'Brien made that happen, didn't he? I mean, Patrick I O'Brien. I legitimately think I could fire a 32-pounder based on his description of how to do it in Master and Commander. Um, but it's it's not the way I'd want to write either. But, yeah, I, I've read him and I love him. <laughs> It's a thing. I remember going when I was selling the book, I went to see several publishers and one of them showed me a graph, you know, a sort of, the, you know, the X and the Y axis and there's four quadrants and they've got, they had like, one of the axes was the hero and the other one was the, you know, the ropes and the, you find your point on this uh, on this sort of I can graph imagine like, your face looking at that graph, actually. I would have liked no, to. No, no, I, I, I'm agree. interested in that. <laughs> I, I, I am extraordinarily, I believe, for uh, the the mean writer, the average writer, interested in the commercial side of publishing. Mm. Very, very interested in it. And I I, I spend a lot of time with my sales team, with my marketing yeah. team, my publicity team. This stuff really, really interests me. I try not to think about it while I'm writing, but I I, I do take a, a very, very clear interest and and deep interest in it. So, um. Do you so use no, I'm three not, act I'm not process. I kind of roughly use the three act breakdown to make sure that I'm not just waffling into the void. But that's about it. Um, I use I use screen structure much more in nonfiction. Actually, I found I didn't really act structure it. I I I know that I tend to write books in three or four parts. And I felt like this was a three parter, and I, I but I, I followed instinct here. Whereas with nonfiction. I'm very, very architectural and strict planning structures for it. I found that actually was counterintuitive. And whenever I sat down and tried to plan this book, Essex Dogs, I I found it ground to a halt. And the best thing I could do was get up early, do some yoga, lie on my sofa with my, you know, my socks off like Rick Rubin um, uh, and just kind of let my thoughts drift, actually. And that was the uh, that was the most difficult thing for me to get into writing wise um but no so i'm so act structure not so much weirdly thought it would be the other way around i thought i'd be more, even more um architectural in this but turned out not to be the case well dan we are just about out of time um the book essex dogs has been out for six months or so is it yeah it comes out in paperback this summer Very june cool. july time yeah yeah can't wait and then book two comes out wolves of winter is October the twelfth, and uh, that's that's even that's the siege of Calais, the thirteen forty six seven. It's a sort of medieval Stalingrad, and it's um, it's wild, it's pretty wild. We're looking forward to it. Um, Great. Hope to see you again soon, maybe to talk about that uh, when it comes out. But it's been an absolute pleasure having you on, Dan Jones. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Great talking to you. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section thank you so much for your continued support we really appreciate our listeners and supporters so make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book